Sandra Renee Cantu was born March 8, 2001. From the moment she was born, Sandra was outgoing and friendly, always engaging with everyone she could, and crying the moment she was left alone. She was one of the rare people who truly seemed to thrive when others were around. And growing up in a small trailer with her mother, Maria, three other siblings, and their grandparents, she would be around people more often than not. The family resided in Tracy, California, a short drive away from the San Francisco Bay Area. Much like many of the people in the Bay, the family struggled to keep up with the rising cost of living. Maria did what she could to support the family, and living with her parents helped ease some of the financial burden. But after Sandra's father left the family, Maria was left scrambling to take care of their three children. Despite the family's financial struggles, Sandra was described as always being happy and outgoing. She loved singing and dancing, and would put on entire performances for anyone who would watch. She especially enjoyed playing with her friends around the neighborhood, and she made new friends incredibly easy. The family resided in Orchard Estates Mobile Home Park, which served as a small and tight-knit community for the family. Everyone knew everyone else, and there was a sense of underlying trust between them, especially with how many small children resided in the park. Sandra and the rest of the kids her age that resided in the trailer park were all extremely close, constantly going between each other's small homes to hang out and play whenever they could. Sandra herself was known for going door to door in the community when she was bored, always looking for something to do and someone to talk to. She was friends with every kid in the area, and every day after school, she would go out and play with her friends. Maria did have one rule for Sandra and her siblings, though, and that was if they were to go out and play with their friends, they couldn't leave the trailer park. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to families living inside of the park, a monster was living amongst them. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Sandra Cantu and how a 28-year-old Sunday school teacher did the unimaginable to her. This case came highly recommended from multiple of my patrons over on Patreon, which is the platform I use to ensure that I can pursue this career with a financial safety net, as YouTube often demonetizes my videos. After a number of tests, I have found that even putting my channel name in the title of the video will result in the video being struck, so I appreciate my patrons for making sure that I can continue to do this full time, regardless of YouTube's decisions. To be clear, even if one of my videos was struck and I couldn't make money on this platform, I still would create content. Patreon just ensures that I can dedicate more time to this. If you are interested in supporting this channel, my Patreon is linked below. But with that out of the way, let us begin. Sandra came home from playing at a friend's house after school at 4 p.m. She dropped off her school bags and then decided that she, like she had so many times before, would go back outside to play. She told her family that she was going outside, and they reminded her to be home by dinner, and she left, skipping down the road to see if any of her friends were around. Around 7 p.m., Maria began to call around to Sandra's friends in the neighborhood, asking if they could send her daughter home for dinner. It was beginning to get dark, and she thought that the eight-year-old had simply lost track of time. However, every house she called said the same thing. Sandra hadn't come over that day, and they hadn't seen her at all. After calling everyone in the park and seeing if they knew where her daughter was, Maria began to get nervous. She didn't think anything was amiss, per se, but she knew that it wasn't like Sandra to go unnoticed. Even if she was playing on her own outside, she was loud and boisterous, and she would have gone to every door in the park before deciding to be on her own. Still, Maria taught her daughter well, and she knew she was likely still within the trailer park, so she set out on her own, looking for Sandra. She called out to Sandra while making her way through the small mobile home park and found no sign of her daughter. After she searched the entire park herself, she realized that it had been nearly four hours since the last time anyone had stated they had seen the eight-year-old, and she quickly called the police and reported her missing. In cases like these, the police response time is usually suspect, and the case is given little attention. However, the Tracy police immediately responded and started a large-scale search for the missing girl. They went door-to-door -door in the mobile home park and talked to everyone in the area, looking for any sign of the girl, and almost instantly, they found a break. The neighbor who lived across the street from Sandra's home had recently put up a surveillance camera, and after checking back on the footage, they caught Sandra leaving her home at 4 p.m., exactly as her mother said. The footage showed the girl skipping away, 
clearly in good spirits and showed exactly what she was wearing at the time of her disappearance, which was vital information. She was wearing a Hello Kitty shirt and black leggings, and the last known images of her were quickly circulated through the media, but it led to a dead end. It seemed that no one in the area had seen Sandra that day, but, seemingly unrelated to Sandra's disappearance, one of their neighbors, 28-year-old Melissa Huckabee, informed the family that her home had been burglarized the same day at 4 p.m. When Maria had contacted the police and the search had begun for Sandra, Melissa texted her, writing, Tell the police that I had something stolen today around 4 p.m. I don't know if that makes a difference or not. The likelihood of two completely unrelated crimes occurring in the same mobile home park at the same time were extremely low, so the police briefly talked to Melissa to see what had happened. Melissa informed the police that she had left an Eddie Bauer suitcase on her driveway, which was just a couple of doors down from the Cantu residence. However, at 4 p.m., around the same time that Sandra had last been seen, the bag was taken. She insisted to the police that she didn't want the investigation into what happened to her bag to supersede the investigation into where Sandra was, but she felt she had to come forward because it could be related. For the most part, the police brushed off Melissa's statements and her missing luggage as being entirely unrelated to the case at hand. The Tracy Police Department wasted no time and spared no expense in their search for Sandra, bringing in multiple of county search teams and other units to help find the 8-year-old girl. Over the course of the weekend, dogs, equestrian teams, ATVs, and a helicopter from the California Highway Patrol were brought in, and dive teams who searched the river miles away from her home. As the search continued, the police spoke to Maria about the family's living situation, and when they heard that she was in the process of divorcing and arranging the custody agreement between Sandra's father, they set their sights on Daniel Cantu. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children estimates that approximately 200,000 of the 260,000 children abducted each year are taken by a parent or other family member, and it only made logical sense for him to become their prime suspect. But Maria and the rest of the family rejected that line of thinking outright. Sandra hadn't spoken to or seen her father in years, and though the couple was divorcing, Maria knew Daniel would never hurt a hair on his daughter's head. He was quickly ruled out as a suspect, given that he was nowhere near Tracy when Sandra went missing, and the case was at a standstill. The Tracy Police Department was small and didn't want their lack of experience leading to the girl's demise, so they contacted the FBI, hoping to get a basic profile of the person or persons who might have taken Sandra. The profile that the FBI returned was that of a white male aged between 25 and 40 with a criminal history of sexual assault or child pornography. Shortly after receiving this profile, Sandra's aunt, Angie Chavez, spoke up about an inappropriate encounter that had occurred years prior. According to Angie, in the summer of 2007, Sandra had been inappropriately touched by an older man at the community pool. She stated that, My mother-in-law saw him march over, sweep her hair off her face, and give her a kiss on the lips. He had been confronted about the encounter at the time, and said it was nothing more than a neighborly interaction. But now that Sandra was missing, the police felt they needed to take a closer look. The man, who was now in his 60s, still lived within the mobile home park near Sandra, and had been interviewed the night she went missing. But with this added information, he was questioned once more. But eventually, they were able to rule him out entirely, and stated that he was, quote, harmless, despite having kissed a six-year-old on the mouth. The neighbors also made mention of an ice cream man who had been seen in the area that day that they had never seen before. He had been seen earlier that day, talking with some of the neighborhood children and selling them treats. But the fact that he had never been seen there before stood out to the community as strange. But later on, he too would be ruled out. The community had come together to support Sandra and her family during this time. Initially, a $2,000 reward had been put up for any information involving the case that could lead to its closure. But as more people heard about the case and saw Sandra's small face on the news and on missing persons flyers, they lent more money to the cause. Businesses and charities raised money to support bringing Sandra home, and multiple candlelight vigils were held in her honor. It was at one of these vigils, once again, Melissa Huckabee approached the police. She was sobbing hysterically 
and was nearly hyperventilating when she approached the officers, and was telling them that she had found a note on the ground. The note was nearly illegible, with multiple misspellings scattered throughout, but it read, Cantu locked in stolen suitcase, thrown in water on Bichetti Road and Whitehall Road. Witness. It was obvious that whoever wrote the note wanted it to appear that they were unintelligent and could barely spell. Not realizing that misspelling the word on while correctly spelling the word Pachetti was unbelievable under any circumstances. Huckabee was inconsolable when she presented the note. However, after they read it, she calmed down completely. Special Agent Michael Conrad would describe the encounter as being incredibly strange and eerie. Her continued insistence that her stolen luggage played some role in the seemingly unrelated kidnapping and her somehow finding a note on the ground that said as much led investigators to believe that she was trying to insert herself into the investigation for attention and validation. The FBI investigators had seen this time and time before, with many people submitting false tips and lying about witnessing crimes for attention. But still, they needed to cover their bases, so they sent the letter in for testing. They also sent a search team to the area indicated on the note, but found nothing, given that the majority of the irrigation ponds were filled with cow manure. Melissa had also been forthcoming with the police when they had originally spoken to them about what she had done on the 27th. Melissa said that she had been decorating her classroom at the church. She told the police that she made a phone call about a stolen suitcase while she was there. When her phone records were obtained, it validated her story, and it seemed, at least for the time being, that she just wanted to feel like she was a part of a nationwide investigation. It wouldn't be until April 6, 2009, nearly two weeks after Sandra had gone missing, that she would be found. Farm workers in the area were draining an irrigation pond when they happened to find an Eddie Bauer suitcase. Thinking that it had been dumped there, they retrieved the suitcase and found Sandra's small body inside. The police quickly arrived at the scene, and Sandra was properly ID'd. Shortly after, during her autopsy, it was found that the 8-year-old had been drugged prior to her death. She had ingested Alprazolam before she was beaten, sexually abused with a foreign object, then smothered to death, and, as you have probably deduced, the bag she was found in just so happened to belong to Melissa Huckabee. Tonight, the police chief tells us that the person or the persons responsible for the death of eight-year-old Sandra Cantu will be brought to justice. Now, Sandra Cantu's body was found inside a black suitcase that was located at the irrigation pond by farm workers this morning off of Bichetti Road. Now, police then took that luggage from the pond and transported the bag to the county where this evening police identified the body of Sandra Cantu. Now, right now, police cannot tell us the exact cause of death, but investigators tell us Sandra was identified by the clothing she was wearing. Now, investigators say the area where Sandra's body was found, search crews did, in fact, comb through that area. Now, we're told the irrigation pond was filled two weeks ago, and authorities believe the luggage floated to the surface. Sandra's body was only two miles away from her home. News of Sandra's death has devastated a number of people in the community. But they have to pay for this. They have to pay it in the worst way. Did you know Sandra or the family in any way? Uh, no, but it kind of it feels like you do because, you know, just like you kind of feel everybody else's pain. And our heartfelt sympathies go out to Sandra's family, her friends, and her classmates. From this point forward, investigators will be looking at all of the evidence that was collected today and the evidence that, and information that we have collected prior uh, in the prior days regarding this investigation. We will be determining the person or persons responsible for this reprehensible act, and we will bring them to justice. And tonight, investigators tell us this is now a homicide investigation. We're told an autopsy on Sandra Cantu's body will be performed tomorrow. No word on how long that autopsy will take. But again, of course, investigators now say this turns into a homicide investigation. For now, we're live in Tracy. Tamani Lewis, KCRA 3 reports. Prior to this point, the police had written Melissa off as an attention-seeking but ultimately well-meaning person. Melissa had previously worked as an event planner and studied criminology in community college. When she moved back to Tracy to help her parents, she became a Sunday school teacher, although some people found her to be a bit strange. Very few people, however, knew her at all. 
Connie Lawless, Melissa's grandmother, would describe her as being a loner who suffered from severe depression and mood swings. Melissa had a history of self-harm as well, choosing to cut herself on her ankles in her youth. She was diagnosed bipolar and schizophrenic, and often kept a cocktail of drugs on her at all times, which included benzodiazepine, also known as Xanax, Adderall, paroxetine, and furosemide. Oftentimes, she would take the medications when she didn't need them, claiming that they were for other things, and making up stories as to why she had to take them at all. On at least two occasions, Melissa had been accused of drugging others using her medication. In January of 2009, two months prior to Sandra going missing, one of the other Cantu's neighbors had accused Melissa of drugging her child. She stated that the girl had come home and was clearly not in her right mind. She could barely stand straight and was having a hard time recalling where she was or what she had done. Her mother took her to the hospital, and she was found to have benzodiazepine in her blood. She contacted the police, and when questioned on the subject, she stated that nothing had happened while the girl was under her care. She was also quick to bring up that the mother had previously done drugs, and that it was much more likely that she had drugged her daughter herself. As the girl who had been drugged had no memory as to what happened, the case was dropped entirely. She also allegedly drugged her ex-boyfriend, Daniel Plowman. Daniel and Melissa had been dating for a while when she told him that she was pregnant with his child. He immediately proposed to her, and the pair set out to get married. However, before the wedding was to take place, she gave him a drink that tasted funny. He had it and then completely blacked out, waking up in a jail cell the next morning for public intoxication. Many people have also speculated that Melissa dealt with Munchausen syndrome, and later Munchausen by proxy. Melissa, according to those who knew her, was the type of person who constantly needed attention and would do anything to get it. Growing up, she would often feign injuries, telling people she had broken her leg by falling out of a tree, despite walking just fine. She told friends she had cancer and other life-threatening illnesses multiple times over, and in multiple instances, told her boyfriends that she was pregnant with their child when she wasn't. When her lies and stories would catch up with her, she would make elaborate tales to justify her actions. But usually, after a year or so, most people would catch on to her lies and stop talking to her outright. She also had an unhealthy habit of labeling those closest to her as abusive whenever it suited her. On one occasion, Melissa accused an ex-boyfriend who had broken up with her of stalking her, threatening to harm her grandpa, and threatening to kill her. She took out a restraining order on him, However, it was later dropped when the police found there was no evidence of wrongdoing on his part. He would go on to claim that he wanted nothing to do with her, and she told him that she would ruin his life. She would later go on to accuse her ex-husband of child abduction and domestic violence, stating that he was an unfit parent. And we sat down with Johnny Huckabee for an interview. The pair divorced in 2005, but he gave GMA a rare and exclusive look into the Melissa he knew and once loved. What was your reaction when you heard that Melissa was accused of this type of violence? My initial reaction was shock and complete disbelief because it's, it's I mean, it's not something you want to think anybody possibly, possible of doing, uh, let alone somebody that you knew and that that's a mother of your child. Well, you were married, but you were young, right? And this was a typical young marriage that ended quickly. Correct. How long were you together? Um... Officially together probably a little bit over a year. How would you describe her personality? How would you describe her to somebody? A carefree person. Um, somebody that I, I really could not see uh, doing something like this. Do you believe that she struggled with emotional issues? I, I do believe that uh, the emotional issues uh, came into play quite often in her lifetime. What kind of mental, uh, emotional issues? Um, she, she did suffer from depression. She did have uh, issues with uh, uh, her, her, her self persona, um, who she saw herself as. Did she ever receive treatment as far as you know? Um, as far as I know that I could positively say, um, no. But um, she was uh, on medication that was prescribed, so I imagine at some point in time she did uh, see somebody for, uh, for the problems. Was she ever violent? Did she ever hurt anybody? Did she ever talk about hurting people? Anything, anything that gives an indication of what we're now hearing about? 
No, no, she, she, she had never, not to anybody else that, I, that I've known, no. Is there any way that this could have been an intentional situation from what you know of Melissa? From what I know of her, no, I don't see this being any type of intentional situation. What's been your best sense of uh, what Melissa's life has been like since you two separated in 2003? Um, well, from, from what I understand, um, she, uh, she went to school and she got a job. She was making fairly good money and she had a pretty good life going, the, the last I had heard. What's your sense of what kind of mom Melissa has been to your daughter? As far as I'm concerned, as much as I know, um, she, she was a good mom to her. When you saw the images of Melissa, the pictures, the video of her uh, in her prison garb, her face, her reactions, do you recognize that person? No. How is she different? The way, the way she walked out there was, was, not, was not the person that I knew. Um, it, it was, looks like she, 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 she was a person in somebody else's body. You holding out hope that this is not true? That the mother of, of your course. daughter? Of course. Um, and and uh, I wouldn't wish this on anybody, um, especially on the family members that, uh, of the victim, but um, mainly for my daughter. I mean, I do not want my daughter growing up with that type of legacy to, uh, to look forward to. Where's your daughter now? Uh, she is in a safe place. And what is your understanding of how your daughter is doing? She is doing uh, very well right now. Um, she does not have any knowledge of the situation that's going on, um, which, which is best. All right, John, thank you. I know this is a very difficult situation. I'm glad to hear that your daughter is unaware and that she's safe, and I wish you the best with that. Okay, thank you. Those who spent any amount of time around her simply just wrote her behaviors off as being attention-seeking and obnoxious, but they doubted that she would ever really do anything to hurt anyone else, although nothing could be further from the truth. Two days prior to Sandra's body being found, Melissa checked herself into Sutter Tracy Community Hospital, claiming that she had accidentally swallowed an X-Acto knife blade while sleepwalking the night before. There currently exists no proof that this claim is real or that she ever sleepwalked at all but the hospital wanted to keep her under surveillance nonetheless. When the news broke that the eight-year-old girl had been found, Melissa excitedly texted her grandparents saying, they're having an 815 news briefing on the suitcase. That was fast. I hope they didn't find anything. She was excited about the update, specifically that it led back in some way to her luggage. It was her suitcase, and it had been where the note that she had found said it would be. She couldn't care less that Sandra had perished in a horrendous way. Later on, she texted her grandmother once more, stating, I hope she wasn't sexually assaulted, which, as we know, she was. From the moment Sandra was found in the suitcase, the police narrowed its investigation entirely. Before, Melissa's insistence that her bag had something to do with the case was nothing if not annoying. The obviously fake note was a sign of someone who desperately wanted to be involved, not the killer trying to point away from themselves. However, they now took notice of the unusual fact that a woman who reported losing a suitcase should be the one woman out of everyone in this complex who should happen to find a note that reports that the stolen suitcase was used to hide the child's body. In a press conference given that day, Tracy Police Sergeant Tony Sheenman told the media that it's not as big of a mystery as it was before, and we believe we're getting significantly closer. We're hopeful that we will have something in the next couple of days. While Melissa was in the hospital, she was placed under police surveillance. She believed this was done because she was vitally important to closing the case, not because she was a suspect, and excitedly told those around her what was going on, not seeming to understand that being excited about a girl's murder was inappropriate. At the same time, the police executed a search warrant on the home she shared with her grandparents and seized her Kia Sportage. Inside the car, they found a post-it note that had been written on, but all the words had been scribbled out in an attempt to make the words illegible. 
Immediately, the post-it note was sent in for testing, and it proved that the words Pachetti Road, Whitehall Road, and Water had all been written on it before they had been crossed out furiously. When they searched Melissa's home, they also found a notebook under Melissa's bedroom dresser. The notebook contained the same paper as the original letter she gave to the police, and there was one singular page ripped out of it. Not only that, but there was enough of an impression on the page behind the one that had been removed, and it was clear to see that the note she had given them came from the notebook. This confirmed what they already knew. Melissa had written the note about Sandra's killing, and she was most definitely the person behind it. The police got another lead when a retired U.S. Marine and his wife notified them they had spotted Huckabee and her SUV at the irrigation pond on their property at Pachetti Road and Whitehall Road between 5.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. on March 27th, the same day that Sandra had gone missing. They reportedly recognized Huckabee on television and described her as distracted and hurried when they saw her at the pond. Three days after Sandra's body was found, Melissa left the hospital. She contacted the police, who had asked her to come in for another round of questioning. When she came in the next day, her lies would completely fall apart. For three hours, the detectives described their evidence to the 28-year-old woman, and she immediately broke down and confessed, although she attempted to portray what had occurred as nothing more than a tragic accident. According to the court documents regarding the case, Huckabee told investigators she was trying to play hide-and-seek with Sandra and suggested she get in the suitcase and jump out to scare Huckabee's daughter, who was Sandra's close friend. According to her story, Sandra agreed, so she zipped up the suitcase with the girl inside. Somehow, though, she immediately forgot the girl was in it. Melissa stated that after putting the girl inside the suitcase, she then loaded it into the car and drove to the church she worked at. When she arrived and brought the suitcase into her classroom, she then remembered that the little girl was inside of it. She unzipped the case and found Sandra dead. Huckabee said she immediately tried to do CPR on the girl and was overwhelmed with guilt for forgetting her in the bag. She went further to claim that she took a small towel, wet it, and placed it on her forehead to cool the girl off and hoped that the water would help resuscitate her. Huckabee said she freaked out and didn't know what to do. Her head was spinning out of control and she was not thinking straight, according to the report. But after a bit, she decided that the best course of action would be to put Sandra's body back into the suitcase and dump it in the irrigation pond. This goes entirely against autopsy, which found that Sandra had been drugged, beaten, sexually assaulted with a foreign object, and then finally smothered. It's clear that Melissa was lying. After her confession, the police got a search warrant for the church. In a kitchen drawer in the back, investigators found a metal rolling pin that had a bent handle and a red-brown smudge. Church members used the rolling pin to make unleavened bread for the Lord's Supper. It would test positive for Sandra's DNA, and it is likely the object Melissa used to both beat Sandra and sexually assault her. Melissa was arrested the same day. But still, the police were not finished with their investigation. After her arrest, the police seized her electronics, only to find that the attack had been entirely premeditated. Melissa had searched on multiple different occasions how to kill a child, and she looked up a specific case in which a father killed their child and hid their body in a suitcase. The police and prosecution were able to put together the timeline of events that had been carried out by Melissa that day and it seemed, at the very least, she tried to do this one time before. When Sandra went outside to look for someone to play with, Melissa lured her over to her home and asked her if she could help decorate her classroom with her. Sandra agreed because she trusted Melissa. She was her close friend's mom, and she believed that Melissa would never do anything to hurt her. Melissa put Sandra in the car, along with the suitcase, and together they drove to the church. When they arrived at the church, Melissa made Sandra a drink, laced with her medication, and waited for the girl to pass out. While she waited, she called the leasing center of the mobile home park and informed them that her suitcase had been stolen from her driveway. After a while, Sandra had passed out. Melissa took the metal rolling pin and sexually assaulted the eight-year-old and then beat her with it. Melissa believed that she had killed the little girl, but she found that she was still breathing. She smothered her, then shoved her body into the suitcase. She then cleaned the Sunday school classroom and drove to the irrigation pond to dump the body, where she was seen by the veteran and his wife. 
Melissa pled guilty to Sandra's murder, but never changed her story, never explaining why she felt compelled to kill her. She also refused to acknowledge the fact that she assaulted Sandra. She was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, and it was at her sentencing she made this statement. Words cannot convey the bad that I feel and the pain that I have caused you. It is not enough that I say I'm sorry, but that is all I can do. From the day Sandra has died, I've had to live with the consequences of what I've done. For the rest of my life, I'm going to have to live with this. I feel responsibility for her death. Not a day, not a hour. this day, there has been no motive given by Melissa as to why she felt the need to kill Sandra, and even if she had, it wouldn't make a difference. Sandra was a bright spark and deserved to live the remainder of her life, but because of Melissa's sick need for attention, she felt justified in her actions, and I wish nothing but the worst for her. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like to see more true crime content, consider subscribing, as I make new videos weekly. If there is a case you would like to see me research and report on, let me know in the comments down below, or email me at dreading.official at gmail.com. I hope you have a wonderful day, and remember to stay safe.